welcome everybody to this talk. It's uh, you know the future of biocompatibility, industry trends and hurdles. Uh, you know, this is a really great time to talk about biocompatibility. I you know I, I talked about um, chemistry testing yesterday, extractable leachables, and how that's you know really undergoing a, a sort of evolution uh, when it comes to the evaluation of medical devices from that perspective and biocompatibility is right along with that. So there is a, a small amount of overlap between uh, you know how extractable leachables chemistry testing is changing and biocomp uh, but but not too much. So you, if you were here yesterday you might see one or two slides that are the, the same but, but not everything. As, as I said things are changing quickly um, and it, it's a great time to be like thinking about this. It's I think the industry as a whole has really moved towards being a little bit more, you know, thoughtful and scientific in the in the way that we evaluate the biocomp of, of medical devices. So to me, that's a, a positive development. Uh, you know, I'll have no time, no problem uh, filling up the time today. There's really, really a lot to talk about when it comes to biocomp. Uh, so, I mean, to that end, I'll just note, we do a three-day seminar where we just expand this out and talk about everything in a lot more detail, uh, you know, including packaging considerations and sterilizations. So this three-day seminar, we have one coming up very soon in London, and then there's one here in, uh, in the U.S. in Chicago in September. So um, if you want some more detail, then, then that, that's available. So... Uh, this is, uh, you know, a part of the consulting group at, at Nielsen Labs. We all focus on biocompatibility, toxicology, and chemistry. Uh, actually, this photo was taken about a, a year ago, and it's a little bit outdated. We've about doubled in size since this time. That's me in the center. You know, I'm, you know, Matthew Jorgensen. Uh, to my left there is Dr. Sarah Campbell. Uh, she's a board-certified toxicologist. Trevor Fish, standing above her. And then on my right hand side is Thor Rollins and Audrey Turley. These are biocompatibility experts who have been, uh, you know, either on the bench or doing biocomp one way or another for, for decades. Both, uh, well, well, really all of us are involved in the formation of these standards, you know, the ISO standards and in Amy uh, to one level or another. So we, we really do a good job of, uh, you know, keeping a pulse on, on what's going on. And we see things, you know, shifting all the time, which is why we have seminars like this that talk about the direction that things are going. I think it's great for everybody, people doing the testing and consulting on the testing and also the manufacturers to know how expectations are changing as they change. So, uh, you know, first, let me just give like just a high level overview about, you know, Biocomp. Again, this isn't to go you know, into the detail of all of the testing. It's more to like talk about things that are really changing or, or, or moving forward. But um, of course, biocompatibility is, uh, you know, going through this process where you want to try to demonstrate that your device, first of all, is not going to harm a patient, right? So if you make and market a medical device and you start to think about all of the things that can go wrong, you know, really what we want to do you know, what we do with sterilization, you know, we want to make sure that your device doesn't give somebody an infection and kill them before it can help them. It's the same with, you know, if we look at something like BET, you know, we want to prevent the thing from giving you a, a critical fever. And Biocomp is more like preventing the device from, you know, killing you slowly, you know, over time, something like that. So there's like different levels there. Uh, but, but that's definitely the root goal. You know, we all want, you know, we're all here because we want to help people, right? We want to make the quality of life for people better. Um, and part of that is first making sure that our devices aren't actually hurting them. So that's that's really the goal. Um, the burden to prove that medical devices aren't harming their users is on the, the manufacturer. So it's the manufacturer's job to go through this testing process and make sure that their devices are safe. Um, when it comes to the specific risks you know, all, all the different things that, I, or all the different ways that a device could harm somebody. These are, you know, sort of tabulated in the ISO 10993-1 document. And in the U.S., you have the FDA's interpretation of the ISO 10993 uh, document. 
And there's, you know, certainly there's more risks than are what listed there, but those are the ones that the FDA really, uh, really cares about. And so that's, that's our job is to prove that it doesn't cause, uh, result in those effects. So even now that we've been doing biocomp for a long time, we still every, I don't want to say every day, but for sure every week, we talk to new manufacturers or old manufacturers and really there's a question of whether biocompatibility needs to be done at all, right? So they'll say, oh, well, this device has been on the market forever. We bought it from somebody else. Or they say, oh, it's made out of titanium. You know, maybe we don't need to do biocomp at all. And, and we see that. And uh, the short answer is, you know, yes, you have to do biocompatibility there's just no way around it. One way or another, you have to address it. So you can't just leave this alone. And, and we see this sometimes too, where uh, a manufacturer might submit to the FDA not doing any biocompatibility, and then the FDA, of course, rejects it and says, <clears throat> please do biocompatibility, and then they, they come to us. So it, it's absolutely clear in the ISO standard that uh, the biological evaluation of any material or medical device intended for the use in humans needs to be uh, you know, part of a structured biological evaluation program. So, and that this should be well documented by knowledgeable and experienced professionals. So it can't just be um, you yourself, the manufacturer conducting this testing unless you're a knowledgeable and experienced uh, professional, right? So biocompatibility has been changing it's been around, right? So we've needed to demonstrate that uh, devices won't harm, uh, but but it definitely has been changing. A lot of this change has happened in the last few years. So the, the example that I like to think about is we have sort of the, the old way that we used to do, you know, demonstrate biocompatibility. And, you know, I, I love motorcycles, so I just had to like throw up some motorcycles up here. So the, the motorcycle on the left there, that was my first bike. It's a 1972 Honda CB350. You know, I really loved uh, that uh, that bike. It was great. You know, it was carbureted, air cooled. It had like the best technology of the the 70s on there. Uh, but you know, it also had a top speed of like 70 miles an hour, and you know, you could see like gasoline like dripping out of the tailpipes, and you know, they had no hydraulics, so it was all like really slow to stop. Um, you know, this is kind of like the old biocomp testing strategy of the of really prior to five or ten years ago this is what it was like we're using animal tests that were developed in the 60s uh, you know it worked right still gets you from point A to B but just not very good uh, definitely less safe less efficient and uh, and so on that you know and that's versus what we have today you know like the triumph street twin there you know we have modern technologies it's a lot more efficient it's a lot more safe uh, you know my hands don't go numb when I ride the new bike because of the vibrations and everything, and I can actually pass somebody on the, the freeway. So, so it's like that. We don't really want to, you know, as fun and romantic it is to like do testing from the 60s. We don't really don't want to do that anymore. Um, part of the way that things are changing, not, not only in terms of test methods, but uh, the strategies and flexibility available to evaluate the biocompatibility of a device. And since these strategies are available now, it means that if you're going to use those strategies, you really need to understand your devices better and understand the risks that they uh, present better than before. So this is uh, from the old uh, G95-1. So this was like the, the Bible before. And the, the strategy always was that you would, you know, look at your device contact, the contact time, and then you could assign it a path on the chart and you just do all of those tests. And that's how you did biocompatibility. Um, the downfall to this strategy was that you really, um, you really didn't have to understand anything about your device. It was just a straight, you know, checkbox approach. So. You could go build a device using, uh, you know, WD-40 from Home Depot and fishing line from Build and Stream. And, you know, I, I throw those out there because uh, one of these devices just crossed my desk with those exact parts, uh, actually a spinal implant. And, uh, and you could just test not knowing anything. And if you pass, then great. And if you don't pass, then you have a problem, right? 
And so, um, so that, that was really the problem before. And that's why, you know, we're moving away from that and, and we're really starting to have to go deeper into our medical devices and try to understand, you know, what's going on with them. And this can be a pretty big step for, for some folks. So, um, you know, you really need to understand the materials that are in your device. You need to know what those materials are. And when I say know what they are, not just ABS, right? but which ABS and how that ABS was manufactured and who their suppliers are so that you know what impurities could be in the ABS, like, like that a higher level of understanding. And you also need to know something about the testing too. If you're going to test it correctly and, and get it through the regulatory bodies, then uh, you know, some of these tests have you know, variables where you have a choice, you know, how sensitive are you going to run the analysis or, or whatever, how big is your sample size going to be, and you need to know that and understand how that can impact the, uh, the outcome in the end. So now we're in a place where there's a lot, so there's a lot larger burden on the manufacturers in terms of what needs to be understood, right? There needs to be an expert in materials that really understands those materials and how they interact with the body. So there's a higher burden there, but the overall testing burden can be a whole lot less. Because if you really understand your device and the materials, then using a risk-based approach to the, the evaluation, you can reduce the burden quite a lot that way. So the, the new ISO 10993, it's all about risk. Risk is all over inside this document, in addition to chemistry. So um, basically, that's the direction that we're going. So we're following the, the path of the Europeans who have you know, really used a risk-based approach for some time you know, towards the end of you know, being a little bit smarter about testing and reducing the number of animals that have to be used in testing. Um, so we're, we're really using a risk-based approach. That's in 10993. And of course, the FDA supports that. So in their draft guidance on the, not the draft guidance, on their guidance on the application of ISO 10993-1, uh, you know, it talks about this risk management process for uh, biocompatibility evaluations. And, and that's really, I guess, like the, the whole theme of this is that, you know, now we're using this risk-based approach um, and, and if I can just read that, that excerpt from their document, it says, such a process should generally begin with the assessment of the device, including material components, manufacturing processes, and clinical use of the device. So this is where you should start. Before you decide on any testing, you should look at your device, what are the materials in it, and what processes does it go through. And then considering that information, you should try to understand what the risks are. And then, once you know what the risks are, then you should try to mitigate those or discover whether or not those are actual risks, either using biocompatibility testing or other evaluations. So there's really a three-step process there that, uh, that's a little bit different. And again, while there's a little bit more effort, it can really save a lot of time in the end. So just, just so that we're clear, I mean, when we're talking about risk, and we deal with this you know, every day now when we write these documents, we're always thinking about the probability of some occurrence and the severity of the harm. And usually, at least for, uh, for us, on, on my side, understanding the severity of the harm is a little bit easier to, uh, to nail down than, uh, than some of these other probabilities. So what I just read, the quote from uh, the FDA, it really points us to a, a flow like this when we approach biocompatibility. So we should have some sort of biological evaluation plan. This is the document where we look at the device, its intended use, what materials are there, and we identify those risks that it presents. And then we prescribe a strategy to address those risks. And that's uh, where we move to the second phase, testing and risk assessments. And then finally, once, uh, once we're all done, then uh, there should be some overarching summary report that says, this was our plan, so this is our device, this was our plan to address the risks. We did this to address the risks, and here's what the conclusion was. The device is uh, biocompatible. So we'll just, we'll step through this process um, a, a little bit. So when we look at the biological evaluation plan, 
Again, this comes straight out of ISO 10993-1. says the biological evaluation shall be planned, carried out, and documented by knowledgeable and experienced professionals. So I, I think it makes sense that we should start a big project with a, a plan, right? And I, I think that we were planning, you know, testing before, but it wasn't so discreetly written down in like its own, you know, document. This is our biological evaluation plan. And that's something that we recommend to do every time now. And, and especially when working with the FDA, they really are like encouraging this conversation, like leading up to a submission where they want to like talk to the manufacturer and provide feedback, you know, going through this pre-sub or Q-sub process. And they promise to be very fast and, you know, polite about it and all of these things. And uh, when you go into this pre-sub, you should have this plan, right? And that's something that uh, that's you know just really highly recommended. I guess it's almost required to to do this. It's something that uh, that we put together. I mean, literally every day at, at Nelson Lab. So it, you know you don't have to go to a third party to do it. You can make this type of document yourself for for sure. Uh, you know when you make a biological evaluation plan, um, what you're doing is you you start with the material information with suppliers, patient contact. You have specification sheets for those. Uh, you know, any known information or previous testing on the raw materials is in there. You talk about the device and how it's categorized. Uh, if there are risks that are going to require like actual experimental testing, then we talk about sample preparation for that, uh, you know, how things will be grouped together in families and, and so on. And then uh, we go on how we uh, identify risks. So the, the use of a biological evaluation plan especially if you're going to go through a pre-sub or a Q-sub with the FDA, it can be a really powerful tool, right? So here, you know, there's a little bit more effort here in the upfront, but it gives you the, the ability to take a little bit more like regulatory risk because you know you're gonna check it off with them before you actually go too far down this path of evaluation. So for example, I mean, I just wrote one of these and it was for, um, you know, a, a spinal implant, not the first one that I mentioned, but a different one, where all of the materials and processing for that implant are really exactly the same as one of this company's other products. It's just, you know, implanted in a slightly different place, but still, I mean, really exactly the same. And they're going through a 510K process. And if you look at that, when I looked at the, when I made the biological evaluation plan, I was able to say, okay, look, we have this product. It has a K number. It was approved. We can prove that this processing and materials are really exactly the same as the other one, you know, therefore, I mean, we, we shouldn't test this thing again. We'll, we'll roll a cytotoxicity test, a, you know, cheap and inexpensive test just to make sure things are under control. But other than that, the only uh, evaluation we're going to do is compare the two processes and really prove that they're the same. And so there you have like this flexibility to say something like, okay, we're gonna do just very limited testing and some evaluation and you can get the FDA to agree to that on the front end so they can read that and say, okay, yeah, we agree. Or they might say, well, we agree mostly, but you, we want you to do this other test and you can get them, you know, the buy-in at, at the front end. Where if you were to do that on the back end, so not show them your plan and say, okay, this is what we want to do. Can we please have your permission? Then uh, they tend to be a little bit more more harsh, like you're trying to like sneak and get away with something, you, you know what I mean? And so uh, this is the, the place for that type of, of layout. And you know, usually for these, the, the strategy, um, you know, if it's a device where the manufacturing isn't exactly the same as the predicate, then usually it's some combination of testing and assessment that gets us there to, to feeling like we can really demonstrate biocompatibility. So that's the first step. Always, uh, you should always do it. And uh, it's really smart to get the FDA to check off on it on the front end because, you know, the devil's in the details sometimes. Okay, so the, the testing and risk assessment part. So this is where, you know, that would normally include, you know, all this classic biological testing that, you know, that we might be familiar with. So cytotoxicity, sensitization, irritation, you know, acute systemic, subacute, subchronic, chronic, carcinogenicity, and genotox, right? Uh, but now what we're saying is 
you know, rather than just go down that list and do all those tests, we have like some options available and you know we should make a choice like what of these that we're going to do so you have the option for material evaluation this is coming more in the front end in the BEP of course there's all the the regular tests that you know we're familiar with uh, chemistry testing is a big thing now that if you have a permanently contacting device um, where you need to demonstrate biocompatibility if you're not doing chemistry testing and you're probably you know wasting I don't know around $200,000, right? And probably six weeks of your time. Uh, so very well accepted by the FDA, routinely done now to address the longer term, more burdensome biological endpoints. And then uh, written evaluations can also be a part of this you know, strategy to address uh, biocompatibility. So the way that this looks in the, the new uh, ISO 10993, the way you see is that uh, rather than having X's on all of those biological endpoints, they now have an E, and that E is for evaluate, right? So it's not that you need to you know, actually perform uh, you know, sensitization every time. It's that you need to evaluate sensitization every time. That evaluation could be that you look at the manufacturing processes and so on. So in those you know, areas of you know, ways to mitigate risk, you know, what's new out there, what, what can be different. So uh, one of the ways that um, it can be different is we're starting to look at some alternatives to animal testing. So this is uh, now fully you know, validated at Nielsen Labs. Uh, we, we love this test. We just published a peer reviewed paper on the validity of um, in vitro irritation testing. So if you're not familiar with the way that this works, we uh, can grow uh, reconstructed human epidermis on like a thin film membrane that sits in some growth media. So like the nutrients can come up. I think I have another slide there, yeah. So the nutrients can come up from the bottom and feed the skin. So it's it's really like real skin. And if you look at it, it has you know ridges that are like fingerprints and everything, right? And the whole point of irritation testing is to see if it's becoming like red and inflamed when in contact with a, an irritant. And now we can, you know, really do this just rather than using, you know, real, uh, you know, rabbit skin, we can uh, use artificial skin to do that. So this is up and running. Uh, we have a few, you know, uh, manufacturers that are doing this now and submitting to the FDA We'll see, you know, how that uh, that plays out. But hopefully, this is going to be like openly and widely accepted by the FDA in the very near future um, for for us to do. So this is on the horizon and in in some ways, you know, active now. Another thing that uh, that we're doing is, you know, in vitro alternatives to sensitization. So this is another test that's just that the classic test for this is pretty uh, frustrating. So guinea pig maximization testing. Uh, this is a, a test that takes weeks. Gosh, it looks like there's some liquid dropping from the ceiling. I hope it doesn't drop on us. Um, anyways, they, uh, it takes weeks. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do. It's been proven that this sensitization test itself is not very sensitive uh, to sensitizers. And um, it, it's one of these things that I think we tallied up one time the probability of failing a test at, at Nelson Lab. So if you run a device and they run all these tests, how often does it fail? So cytotoxicity testing, for example, fails, I think, like one out of 50 times, something like that. But sensitization testing is more like one out of 100,000 times. So it basically never fails anyway. So it's like, why are we wasting all these guinea pigs? Um, so, I mean, this test, it, it's pretty, uh, you know, straightforward to do. Uh, you know, basically you want to see something can only be a sensitizer if it can bind to proteins, right? So that's one of the steps in the sensitization pathway. And so basically we check to see if it can bind to, uh, to proteins or not. So um, it's a colorimetric method, pretty, pretty straightforward. We're a little bit farther back on this one than the irritation testing. But I would love to see this one come fully online with the, with the other in vitro testing. Uh, another thing that we're, you know, I, I guess I don't want to say this is like on the horizon because we're actively doing extractable leachables chemistry testing now. Um, but using ke uh, chemistry testing, you know, 
as applied to some of these other endpoints like sensitization, this is becoming a little bit more acceptable as well. So if we do extractable leachables chemistry testing, we can screen whatever we find against like the lists of known sensitizers and we can make some conclusion um, that way. Also, the, the way that we do chemistry testing, like some of the details, uh, it's really kind of variable and, and evolving. You know, I'll just talk about that a little bit briefly now. Uh, but, but before I talk too much about e &L, let me just make sure that I define how we're using these words in this context because it can kind of mean different things to different people. So extractables are any, uh, any compounds that can come off of or migrate out of a device when it's uh, exposed to conditions that are worse or more aggressive than clinical use, whereas leachables are you know, compounds that we would expect to come off when it mimics clinical use. Um, this is kind of like a simplified picture there where you know, hopefully or ideally you know, all the, the leachables would also be extractables. There are you know, you know, potential exceptions to that depending on the scenario. Um, the, the, the way this is changing the, and the evolution here is really coming from the details of how the analysis is run and what exactly is included and, and so on. So when we talk about this type of chemistry testing for medical devices, we have a sort of unique problem where we have some sort of solution where we really want to look for anything and everything that could have come off of the device and gone into the solution. and. Uh, in some ways, that's a little bit, you know, it's straightforward to say that, but it's really complicated on the, the technical side. Like, what do you do to really accomplish that goal? And we can agree on a, a few things. Like, if we look at everything that could come out of a device and try to group it by analytical methods, I think we, we all agree that, you know, these methods should include chromatography steps. So whatever it is that comes out of a device into solution, First, we have to separate those compounds from each other, and we, uh, I think, also agree that it should, ha uh, you know, be able to identify and quantify whatever is there. So we really should do, you know, mass spec should be part of that. We can't ignore metals, you know, of course. So that's part of it. So everybody agrees that okay, when we do chemistry testing to support biocomp of medical devices, we should have ICPMS and GCMS and usually LCMS, um, but. The question is, and where things are evolving, are some of the technical details behind that. So I don't know how many people here are experts in chemistry or know enough, know some chemistry. But so, so for example, when you run these tests, you have a choice. You could make a calibration curve with the compound in question and really quantify what it is that you see, or you could estimate the, the concentration using a compound that's different than the one that you found. And there, there's two ways to do that. One is, you know, an estimate, you know, the, it could be a pretty good estimate, but it's kind of unknown how good that estimation is. The other way, you really nail down the accuracy and precision of that result. Well, as you might imagine, it's a lot harder to really nail down the accuracy and precision of all your results when you run a test like this. Uh, and so in the past, a lot of folks haven't been making calibration curves for all of the things that they see, and they've just been reporting estimated concentrations, right? What we're seeing now from the FDA is that they're saying, okay, wait a second, you know, we're, they're kind of like catching up on all like this technical detail with the chemistry, and now they start to want to see some of this validation work that they didn't want to see before. So that's one point there where things are changing, it's starting to be a little bit harder to do chemistry that way because of this uh, validation work that's embedded there. Another way that chemistry is changing and, you know, and biocompatibility is this new ISO standard 18562. This focuses uh, exclusively on gas pathway devices. Uh, this for me was like uh, you know, heaven sent because we did a lot of gas path devices in the past and they just didn't fit into this framework of 10993 very well. Because if you're going to evaluate a gas path device, say something like an oxygen concentrator, it technically is external communicating with permanent contact to tissue, to tissue, right, the lung tissue. Um, and you go through and you like try to do a cytotox on that, and like if it has like the zeolite is the active ingredient in a lot of you know concentrators, it's like 
explodes when you touch it to water. So it's like, how do you test that? You know, um, eighteen five six two is great because you using a risk based approach. You really just look at okay, what can actually reach the patient that would affect them. You know, the volatiles carried by the gas and any particulates that could be carried by the gas. So you really just focus on just those two things, the volatiles and particulates. Uh, to me, it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, you know, another area where things are changing is, you know, once you have these types of chemistry results, these should be interpreted in the form of some toxicological risk assessment, you know, the details about what that risk assessment should include, and you know, to which sensitivity the analysis needs to go is something that, that shifts all the time. So the new ISO 10993-18 will rely a lot more heavily on this concept of an analytical evaluation threshold that goes comes into play with the toxicology. So, so that's in the pipeline. Uh, you know, finally, so, so if we take a step through this whole process that I talked about, we have this biological evaluation plan and it being basically required is, is pretty new. And this risk assessment of the materials and the device to understand what you know, hazards it's posed is pretty new. Then you go through the testing where you have these you know, new options. And then finally you come to this biological evaluation report. So this is something that ISO 1093 you know, explicitly asked for that the FDA also you know, really, really wants. They, they really hate it when a manufacturer just gives them like a boatload of like test results. This just tends to like irritate them, you know, and, and you really don't want to irritate your FDA reviewer. So uh, the, the capstone really should be a biological evaluation report. And this is like what I said, where you say, okay, this is the device. These were the materials. We identified those risks. And since those were risks that we identified, we did all of this stuff to address that. And guess what? Everything is good. The test passed. The, the tox evaluation said it wasn't a hazard. Therefore, the device is biocompatible. And this is like the, the front end of like a big stack of you know, papers that you would give to the, to the FDA, right? Um, one of the, the final things that I want to talk about before I, I think we're close to running out of time are written evaluations that discuss changes that you make to medical devices. So I've learned something about marketing people and engineers is that you know they like to change things a lot, and you know these changes can come kind of like late in the game when it when it comes to a medical device, and sometimes it can be very expensive to address the safety of those changes. Well, one of the the goals of the the FDA is to make sure that they're requiring or asking for the least burdensome approach to evaluating the safety of a device. So this is, this is one of the goals. And so to that end, oh my goodness. I like leaned up against a button. Um, so to that end, you know, a lot of these smaller changes can be written or can be addressed with just some sort of written evaluation. And this is something that we do all the time. So for example, imagine that you make a sensor wire, right? And on the sensor wire, you're going to change a coating. And the question is, do we have to repeat all this biocompatibility testing to address this coating? Well, something that we can do is that we can say, okay, well, wait a second, how much coating is actually there? And we'll sit down pen and paper and calculate, oh, well, it's you know one one hundredth of a microgram. And we'll say, okay, well, wait a second, you know, according to, you know, toxicological consensus, anything that's below one and a half micrograms per day is not of concern, right? This concept of the TTC can be really, really useful. So if a change amounts to less than one and a half micrograms of what we're talking about, we can often just write it off immediately. And we just say, well, it's below the TTC, you know, even if this coating were the most hazardous carcinogenetic drug that we can think of, it still would be safe, then uh, it's case closed. So this uh, type of thing is available. Uh, this type of evaluation is something that uh, I think makes a lot of sense. Usually when we go into a, a process like this, you know, it really matters what the type of contact to the patient is, right? So when we consider this, and, and here I give, you know, I, I use the term colorant because that's usually what's changing. 
if you change something that's like embedded in a device that never contacts the patient, it's, yeah, we just say, okay, this change doesn't matter, right? If it's just a limited contact, then they have a lot more flexibility with how, um, you know, how it's assessed. The TTC for a limited contacting device is 120 micrograms instead of 1.5, and that's, you know, relatively a lot. So there's a lot of flexibility there too. Okay, so I think, you know, I've rambled and, and talked very rapidly now up until about my time has expired. I will just stop here, but uh, if you have any questions, I'm, you know, happy to, to take, some, take some questions because I do love to talk about this stuff. I don't know, I see a lot of thoughtful faces, but not a lot of bravery. <laughs> okay, well, then we'll, we'll wrap it up. If you do have any questions that you want to ask in front of a group or something, then uh, I'm around, I'm available at Nilsson's uh, booth there, or you can just talk to me after the, the presentation. All right, so thank you.